Good evening, and welcome to this special edition of Doctors on Call on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Dr. Paula Termulin, Regional Campus Dean at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth Campus, and I am your host this evening. This is our final scheduled special program to answer viewer questions about the coronavirus. We have doctors stationed on the front lines battling this virus here to answer your questions. The telephone numbers and email address for your queries can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening are Dr. Rajesh Prabhu, an infectious disease specialist at Essential Health in Duluth, and Dr. Nick Van Dielen, ER physician and chief medical officer at St. Luke's Hospital in Duluth. Members of the WDSE staff are waiting to take your calls and emails, and once again, we thank them for keeping us safe and ensuring that we have proper social distancing on the set. So now, on to this week's discussion. So Dr. Van Dielen, when someone comes into the hospital with COVID-19, does she go to a special unit where staff have gotten special training on how to care for patients with this virus? And then are there separate ICU uh, facilities for patients who have COVID-19? Uh, yeah, Paula. So uh, we've had fortunately some time to prepare uh, for COVID-19. And uh, we are uh, from the time a patient really comes into the emergency department, based on their symptoms, we are directing them to uh, specific rooms. Actually, all of our staff have been trained on appropriate uh, protection uh, and protective measures. If they end up uh, being admitted to the hospital with COVID-19, we do have a specific intensive care unit. Uh, we have also a specific unit uh, on the general floors and a big part of that is that they are negative airflow uh, because those patients sometimes uh, participate in certain procedures that make them more infective. Uh, so I, I think that uh, now uh, the hospital, uh, and we've talked about this some in, in other venues, but it, it's a safe environment. We, patients truly are cohorted together and patients who have COVID are in a, a, a particular unit, door closed, negative airflow. Great. And, and Dr. Prabhu, what's going on at your hospital? It's probably the same thing as St. Luke's. I mean, we do have patients with COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do, we do have a dedicated floor for COVID patients mm -hmm. and a dedicated ICU. And I, I think that the most important thing is to emphasize is the safety measures that we take both for the staff and the patient. Um, as I've talked about before, it's primarily transmitted by droplet contact, meaning People talk about the airborne thing. So it's not like a person has COVID and like 20, 30 feet down the hallway, someone will catch that person's COVID virus. So the measures that we do, we have the same thing about the negative airflow uh, in the rooms. We recon you know, reconfigure the rooms for that. The protective equipment that we have on really uh, minimizes the risk to healthcare workers and makes it safe for both patients that are in the hospital for COVID and for other reasons as well. Well, and I think this is a great time to really speak up about the idea that if you have something that you think needs medical attention, don't be afraid to go to the doctor or go to the hospital, right? Uh, because we know that there are people who've delayed, people who've had chest pain or abdominal pain and they're not getting looked at fast enough. Mm -hmm. So, well, so Dr. Prabhu, uh, one of our viewers wrote in this week that they've been reading a book about the 1918 influenza pandemic. And the author mentioned that the flu seemed to strengthen with multiple passages through individuals, but later on it was observed that the flu virus got weaker or seemed to get weaker as it infected more people. Does that make any sense? And could we expect that with, with uh, the coronavirus? So when you, whenever you have a novel virus, that pandemic flu of 1918, it was a type of virus that hadn't been seen by the population before. So when it inf infects the population, they typically get severe versions of the flu, high death rate. Um, and that flu doesn't go away for that one season. It typically comes back every year, I guess, like seasonal influenza does. Mm -hmm. But as it does that, it does change mutated drifts. So it may not be as aggressive the subsequent times around. And also the population that has seen it before has immunity. So it's less, it, it spreads less. And also people that may have seen it before and they get reinfected don't have a severe version as the previous time. Okay, 
So, and there's so much that we've learned about the coronavirus to date, but I, I know it's, it's really not the, the same virus. It's a, it's a totally different beast. And so, so the question I think on all of our minds is what will this fall bring, right? right? And I've seen various reports of could be worse, could be not so bad, who knows, so. And I can just add on that, when we had that pandemic 2009 mm -hmm. H1N1, they were actually finding that the older population wasn't getting as infected as much and being hospitalized to the same extent as regular influenza. And the theory was that they were part of a generation of people that saw a similar virus mm -hmm. when they were younger. So when right. it came around again, they weren't hospitalized at the same rate as you would typically see for say an older population with other health conditions. Well, you know, a question I have on my mind because we do have influenza that is very cyclical and we see it every year, whether or not the protective measures that we're taking around the coronavirus may in fact help us stay away from influenza as well, so. Well, I think we actually saw that this year. Uh, a lot of the protective measures, the social distancing, the masking, the hand hygiene, really uh, shut down influenza season, not to mention, I think a lot of other infectious mm -hmm. diseases that we would typically see and that, I think, uh, at least in the emergency department, and I think we, we saw it on, our, on the floors too, really decreased the number of total patients that we would typically see from infections. Yeah, maybe a tiny silver lining. Yeah. So, so uh, Dr. Uh, Van Dielen, while we know most deaths have been in the elderly, can you talk a little bit about uh, the 20 to 60 year olds that get hospitalized and maybe how long they stay in the hospital or what, what that, the experience might be a little different? Sure. Uh, the, Again, this is primarily a respiratory virus, even though it has uh, quite an extensive uh, list of uh, potential symptoms that it can cause. And I think it's important to remember that uh, although there are, you know, most of the hospitalizations in the state of Minnesota have been in that age range, 20 to 60, mm -hmm. uh, most people of that age do fine with it. And many are essentially asymptomatic. Those that are hospitalized tend to have a longer hospital course than many of the other illnesses that people are hospitalized for. Again, it's a respiratory illness. Many of them require support with oxygen and uh, some procedures that we can do around maximizing their oxygen while their uh, lungs really kind of deal with the disease. And uh, the length of hospitalization, it probably is in the seven to 10 day range, which is mm -hmm. quite long uh, nowadays. Yeah, are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, I mean, the people that we see in the hospital are the sickest of who have COVID-19. Mm -hmm. The majority of people that have it don't get hospitalized. And uh, we're seeing the same thing in terms of, they, a lot of, it's, the main thing is like the oxygen requirements. You oxygen know. requirements. There's okay. var various versions, nasal cannula, the typical one you see in the nose. We have other versions where you can put more oxygen, it's called like heated high flow. And the most, uh, you know, cons um, I guess, advanced support is mechanical ventilation where they're putting on a breathing mm -hmm. machine. Right, okay. So we, we, we got an email uh, right before the show tonight about someone who has recently gone to their local pharmacy uh, to get the second um, uh, booster shot or, or shot in, in the shingles uh, uh, sequence. And they were told that the CDC doesn't know the effect of immunizations on the virus and so they weren't given their additional shot or their immunization. So last week we had talked about how we've really wanted to uh, encourage people to get their annual flu shot and other vaccines that they might might need. Are you aware of anything new and, and why or kind of how we might manage when people need to get that second shot in a sequence perhaps? Well, I, I, for kids, they're emphasizing that a lot of kids are delaying their immunizations because of the fear of COVID and they should still continue to get their immunizations. Right. What we do simply is when they come in for the immunization, gets to make sure they have no signs or symptoms of any infection, whether it's bacteria, viral, or COVID. I don't see that there's any contraindication to get the second shingle shot, which is the chicken pox kind of virus. Right, and, and now of course, if you're ill, right? I mean, if you have a fever, if you're Ill, it, for any reason, typically we avoid giving people injections at that time unless they're designed to treat whatever the Ill, illness might be. Right, so, correct. okay. Um, so gentlemen, uh, do we know the general average age of death from COVID-19 in Minnesota right now? Well, I think it's, uh, it's in the 80s, mm -hmm. 83, something Somewhere, like that. Yeah, I think it's like 83 is uh, the median age, which yep. of course is 50% of the people are below 83, 50% of the people are above 83. Mm -hmm. 
And so that really is a fairly significant uh, yeah, advanced and stage. It, it seems like uh, early in the course, and mm -hmm. it still feels like we're early in the course of this pandemic, uh, much of what we've seen has been outbreaks in congregate settings, primarily nursing homes, assisted living, uh, and, and those individuals tend to be older. They tend to have comorbid disease. It feels like, as we watch the state data, and I, I'd be interested to hear what you say, Rajesh, that we're starting to see more evidence of community spread. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see a younger age group. Uh, it, 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 it's interesting, it just feels like there's a switch afoot. There still are these flares of uh, outbreaks uh, in congregate settings and there's a lot of work being done to try and mitigate those. Uh, but I, I, it's interesting to, uh, to watch the phenomenon change. Yeah. I I understand it's like 85% of the deaths in Minnesota are people that live in congregate settings, long-term facilities, you know, mm -hmm. assisted livings, nursing homes. Right. So that's the most vulnerable part of the population for COVID. So it, it makes me start to think a little bit about how we can't go on forever in, in, the, in the ways that we've been doing. And, and you're already starting to see some modifications of this. I mean, I was honestly very thankful that I got a phone call from from the place where I get my hair cut today so that I can go back and get my hair cut. Um, but I do appreciate that um, I think we're all on the lookout for a spike, particularly like after this weekend, the holiday weekend and people traveling up the shore and, and will some of the counties. Uh, we, I, I don't think we've seen any of that yet. And I, and I do know we had free testing over the weekend. Do we, do we know anything about what we might have learned from that experience? It's pretty interesting actually that uh, of, of the 1,409 uh, individuals who were tested at the armory, there was only one positive. I don't know if you know any more about the test that they performed, but that I think speaks to, at least up here, an extremely low uh, community prevalence. I know in the cities, they tested just under 10,000 uh, individuals and they were uh, just above 5%, I think, uh, for prevalence rate. So we still have very, very low community spread if that's to be believed. Yeah, and I don't know the details, but I think a lot of people that went for testing were asymptomatic, I mean, they had right. no symptoms. And I think that kind of proves the point is that, I think the fear is that there's so many people in the community that have it and don't know it. Mm -hmm. So we had a sample of the Duluth community area, and it was a very low percentage, is my understanding. It's, it's like 0.08%, it was very low. And that's inconsistent what we've found in other studies, say from Italy or Iceland, where they surveyed the whole population or large bun you know, part of it, and they found an extremely low rate, like 0.2%. Okay. Well, that's, I think that's a little bit reassuring to hear, but I think uh, we also recognize, especially with the nice weather, we're going to have sort of intermingling with people coming from areas that are a little higher prevalent. So important to uh, continue the safety measures. So when you, um, if somebody has an internet visit, this is sort of a general medical question, uh, and they get lab tests, um, how can they get the information? How do we deliver that information, perhaps through a virtual visit, if they're not coming into the office? So there's uh, a couple ways it can occur. Probably the most efficient way is by uh, accessing the, the patient portal. Mm -hmm. And yep. uh, I, I, think, I, I think both Essentia and St. Luke's have a patient yep. portal. And if uh, sometimes it's a struggle uh, for uh, us to use our computers in that way. And I know uh, our offices are there as a resource to help people get set up in that. And that's one of the things that we've actually been trying to work on is to assist uh, our, our patients so that they utilize that. I, I know many of our primary care physicians and specialists still will send out a letter, uh, snail mail, uh, although, uh, again, I, it feels like it's a bit more efficient and helpful if you have a computer, you have reliable internet. Well, and one thing that I've found using that particular, uh, as, a, as a surgeon and calling patients back with pathology reports, um, you know, we get so many spam calls. I can try to call oh, and, yeah. and people don't pick up, but I can communicate very effectively. And then also for, for patients who, um, particularly older patients that have family members helping them with their care, if they're able to see that information in written format, they can share it very quickly. So I'm a huge fan of having those patient portals. I think that's, that's been really good. Um, so uh, here's another quick one. Um, are, the pa are all patients admitted to the hospital tested for COVID-19? Well, I, I can speak for St. Luke's. Uh, 
we hadn't been doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had been testing uh, patients who uh, had the possibility of COVID-19. Um, and that seems to have been working well. And uh, the specific reason for that is because we were, uh, we, we were only given a certain allotment of the rapid tests that we use. Yep. Uh, most of our tests still are sent out to the Mayo Clinic. And so they take anywhere from a day to three uh, to come back. So it wasn't particularly helpful. We just this week now are moving to uh, test uh, all admissions and all transfers. And even prior to this, we were testing for specific locations as well, locations that we, uh, like on the behavioral health unit, where we mm -hmm. have really a difficult time uh, maintaining the same sort of isolation and protective measures that we can on our, our COVID specific units. And, and I know we've been testing over at Essentia all the patients undergoing surgery so that we can protect our staff and, and those mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the patients were uh, around that patient. And then do you know if all the patients are all admitted patients yet are being tested at, at St. Mary's? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, I know other health systems are doing that, but I think that the weekend experience Memorial Day of testing the community, certainly if, if the prevalence, if there's more COVID going on in the community, you get a higher yield to test everybody. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, you know, we test obviously people that have symptoms, people that come from congregate living settings, nursing homes, yep. people that need to be placed in a closing of behavioral health, people that go to surgery. I think we're expanding for people that have procedures in daytime, say if they need chemotherapy, radiation therapy, I think we're going towards that direction, but um, yeah, I think some of it has to do with our testing capability. Right. I mean, there's what they call a test that we do in-house and we can get a quick result. There's another version that's slower or a send out. So a lot of it has to do with our testing capability. Well, and it's been reassuring to see how that's really ramped up. And, uh, you know, the University of Minnesota, in addition to Mayo and partnership, has really helped the state to be able to produce additional testing. And I think that's helping us understand more about the prevalence and, and being able right. to do things like start to test all patients as needed mm -hmm. when they come into the hospital. And I just want to just add one more point in terms mm -hmm. of the safety of the patient is, and which wasn't talked about before, since all healthcare providers are universally masking yep. and eye protection, and even if a patient develops COVID during their hospital stay, meaning even if you get tested on admission, it doesn't guarantee you that you will not develop COVID later in your hospital stay. Mm -hmm. So the measures that we take for staff, the measures that we take for patients, I think it's still a very low risk situation for spread within the hospital. And, and also, I, I know we talked about this at the beginning of the show, I, you know, watching our custodial staff, you know, clean the handrails, clean the doorknobs. I mean, it's really, it's been very reassuring to see the numbers of precautions that are being taken. So uh, we have a question about, uh, again, influenza A, uh, versus COVID, can an influenza A diagnosis possibly have been mistaken for COVID-19? So maybe that's a question about the similarities or mistakes that we might make in diagnosis. So the, the test that for influenza is different for COVID. You mm -hmm. can have both. So originally that was the concern when COVID was happening. Mm -hmm. Like we were guess originally testing, we're just gonna test you for the regular viruses. If something shows positive like influenza, we were not gonna do the COVID mm -hmm. testing because there wasn't much capabilities for testing. It's theoretically possible for both, but there's no cross reaction between the two tests. Okay. So every week we have had a question about masks. And so I wanna thank Richard for making sure we get one on tonight. Uh, so are masks used that if you use your mask for 30 minutes or less, does it need to be disposed of? And I think that must be the disposable masks. Maybe we can talk a little bit about how to take care of your cloth mask too. Yeah, I, I, I think it depends a little bit on the mask, uh, but uh, no, I, I think it is, our, our recommendation has been, and this is uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, keeping in, in mind the fact that we need to be uh, good stewards of the amount of PPE that we have, uh, that as long as it's not soiled, uh, that people stick to one mask mm -hmm. per shift and the mask is kind of specific to the risk level of the area that that individual is working in. 
Uh, in regards to the cloth mask, uh, nope, uh, same thing I think applies. And again, that's really to protect others from myself. Mm -hmm. And I know we all have our masks with us tonight, yeah, but we do in uh, our pockets, I know. we're just appropriately distanced that we can <laughs> not have to wear them so people can hear us, I suppose. Uh, but uh, no, I, I, I stick to one mask uh, all day long. Yeah, and just washing in soap and water, right? Yep, if right. you've got a cloth one. Well, and then there's a question I know that come in through the week about N95 masks, and I know we've been reusing them at the hospital after mm -hmm. they've undergone UV light treatment, uh, and there's a few other ways that they've been taken care of. So I believe you can use them, depends on the mask and the brand, I think, uh, up to 10 times. Yep. Uh, and, be, and, and we get them in our little brown paper bags, and they come back to us. <laughs> so we know it's, we get the same one back. Um, so uh, we have a question about our patients who are positive for COVID-19 requesting experimental treatments. And I think uh, that sort of opens the door for what kinds of experimental treatments are being considered right now. So well, you know, the treatments that are available are is that antiviral called remdesivir. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is called convalescent plasma, meaning we get the, uh, someone that's had COVID, they donate blood and they take the plasma, which have antibodies. Mm -hmm. against the COVID virus, and then we infuse them into the patient and hoping to okay. treat the infection. Um, then there's another treatment. It's more to shut down the immune system because they thought it's an immune system, an overdrive. So there's medications that are used for that as well. Um, there's more information that's come out on remdesivir and how effective it is. Um, the same with convalescent plasma. Well, and I know we're not really doing any preventative treatments for frontline workers right now. We're not giving them, administering any medications. And we know there's been a lot in the news around uh, hydrochloroquine and, Drugs, yes. and trying to understand what that, the use of it might be. And, and we act understand that that right now act for active treatment has really been on hold yeah. because there could be uh, some danger associated with it. We had a question this week from um, uh, some grandparents. They're both over 70 and they were tested in Duluth this weekend. They're waiting for their test results, but if we only have had one so far, we'll assume that it wasn't one of the, this couple. They would like to go visit their grandkids who are ages four and six and who have not had any contact with other kids and their parents have been working from home and not really, you know, maybe a couple of trips to the grocery store. They'd like to know if they can do a one day visit with social distancing and hand washing. Yes. There's a, there is a yes. birthday coming up. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think that really illustrates how we are going to have to learn to live with this yep. and to not put people at risk, but to also, you know, just sort of start to integrate into our lives how we need to carefully um, wash our hands, yep. wear a mask, socially distance as needed. Okay. Well, I, I think it's a great, we don't mean to minimize that question, right? right? The social distancing has been a very powerful tool for the state of Minnesota. So. I think uh, we can do that if we do it uh, carefully uh, and still get together with family. So I think that's a great question. Yeah. All right, we're gonna do rapid fire because we're coming down to the last <laughs> few minutes of the show. Doxycycline, do antibiotics prohibit the body from fighting COVID-19? Uh, no, we actually yeah. give it antibiotics because sometimes when they get COVID-19, they get another infection of bacteria, so we do give antibiotic therapy. Okay. Uh, can an asymptomatic person transmit the virus all the time or only if showing symptoms? They can transmit it about 40 hours prior to symptoms that de to develop. Okay. All right. Should senior citizen volunteers return to work at a thrift shop? Ooh. Um, Sounds like it depends. Yes, I think so. <laughs> I would guess say the older you are, the higher risk you are for having mm -hmm. a more severe case. So it's kind of that risk benefit thing. Yeah, just trying to really be careful about that. Okay, all right, can the virus be transmitted through a cut in the skin? I would say no. Nope. Nope, okay. So when will, at this point, when do we think COVID-19 will peak in our area and what would be our, uh, and, and so, so, so we're sort of when do we think it'll drop off? <laughs> you want to take a stab? The, yeah, right. No, the, I, I mean, I, there are a number of models, and I'm, I, I would love to hear what Rajesh says. I, I think the latest uh, seems to suggest somewhere that we will have some sort of a surge uh, between uh, June and October, and what that That's looks like. That's a long like, time. I know. <laughs> 
R Rajesh, put some refinement on well, that for us. <laughs> I, I would just say um, you, you, we can have small surges anytime from our long-term care facilities, and it's happened. The right. Yep. All you need is one nursing home with a lot of people that live there mm -hmm. to have an outbreak, and then your hospital is full. And yep. it doesn't take, it'll well be before October. So that's why we're so careful with the long-term care facilities. Very good. So, uh, you know, we know that there's been a lot of mental health challenges. Um, I mean, people are stressed, they've been isolated and so forth. Um, I think particularly in the emergency room, what are we seeing around um, maybe people who are in acute stress? What resources might we have within the community to be able to help people? Yeah, I think the, uh, just like uh, for um, other types of health, a lot of the resources have moved towards uh, uh, telehealth-based and some of that has uh, really become quite sophisticated. Uh, we are seeing really large numbers of uh, uh, people with uh, significant uh, uh, mental health exacerbations, uh, a lot of overdoses. Uh, it is really a terrible time uh, uh, for our community. And I, I think that uh, un unfortunately, a lot of that in person sort of care mm -hmm. that is really uh, important, we, we can't continue to offer as well. So. All right. Well, gentlemen, I really want to thank you for being here this evening, Dr. Rajesh Prabhu and Dr. Nick Van Dielen and our phone staff and crew from being, for being here this evening. I'd really like to thank our viewers for all of your wonderful questions and all the doctors and medical experts who've joined us uh, on our special series of programs this spring. A special thanks to, uh, to uh, Linda Liskowitz at our medical school for her work as the program coordinator. Let's all do our part to keep this pandemic manageable. Continue to practice physical distancing, wash your hands, sanitize those touch, safe, uh, those, uh, touch surfaces. Thank you so much for watching and have a safe summer. <laughs>